All right, good afternoon, everyone. We'll get underway here. Welcome back to uh, the Lou Bar Center at Eckstein Hall here, Marquette University Law School. Good to see everybody again. Hope you had a great holiday break. Welcome again to the spring semester of On the Issues events. We're glad to have you back. Uh, this, of course, is our uh, continuing series of conversations with news, policymakers, people who we say are doing interesting and important work in this region and beyond. Today we are joined by uh, Joseph J. Ranney. Uh, J. Ranney is the uh, Adrian P. Shuni Fellow of Law and Legal Institutions here at Marquette Law School. He teaches at the law school. He is a partner at uh, DeWitt Ross and Stevens. Uh, the law firm in Madison, and he is the author of a number of books, and this is his latest. It's called Wisconsin and the Shaping of American Law. Uh, it's a fascinating book, talks about the origins of our legal system and Wisconsin's role, frankly, in that legal system. What we did, were we independent, were we bold? Uh, we'll talk about all of that with Jay Ranney. Won't you please give him a warm welcome to Marquette University Law School. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's an honor to be here. Great to have you here, Jay. Uh, I know these are familiar uh, uh, places for you, but uh, it's great to have you back. Uh, let's talk a little bit about why you wrote this book, why you felt you needed to write this book. Well, I, for two reasons, basically. Number one, I, I love history, and when I became a young lawyer, I spent a lot of time in the dusty stacks of law firm and law school libraries reading ancient volumes of Wisconsin reports. As I, uh, as I read those reports, I read cases about things like timber trespassing rights and buggy accidents, <laughs> and really they opened up kind of a lost historical world to me. And having the history bug, I became very curious about that and thought, you know, how can we understand the law in the context of how it developed, how it was 100, 150, 200 years ago. One thing led to another, and uh, we're sitting here today talking about the book. Well, we're going to walk through the origins of our legal system and end up at the point we're at today. But before we do that, give me a sense of Wisconsin's role. We talk about its role in the shaping of American law. How would you describe the role Wisconsin played, generally speaking? Wisconsin, I think, can be best, its, its contribution to legal history can best be expressed by a statement that uh, Edward Ryan, a, a former Chief Justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, made in the 1850s during the controversy in the state over slavery. Wisconsin at that time was defying the United States Supreme Court's efforts to require our state to uphold the federal fugitive slave law. And Ryan, who was a defender of the Supreme Court, uh, defended it by criticizing Wisconsinites, saying basically people in Wisconsin who trust nothing to time, trusting nothing to providence, try to make a world perfect, uh, whereas in fact in this world nothing is perfect. That to me is kind of the essence of the Wisconsin spirit. Whatever else we have been, we have followed our own path. We have kind of marched to our own legal drummer over the years. In some cases, that has made us a, a truly progressive state. Uh, the classic example is the progressive era, which I think we'll talk, talk about, about in a bit. But there have also been times where we have kind of held back. We have not followed the pack. For example, uh, in the 1960s, there was a very rapid change from fault-based divorce to no-fault divorce. Uh, you went from zero states having no-fault divorce in 19. 70 to nearly all states had it by 1980. We were one of the last, and the reason we waited is because we wanted to get it right. We wanted to work out some of the bugs that early states had not worked out. So we have a streak of independence, uh, and at times we were leaders. That would be safe to say? Very definitely. Okay. Let's talk about the origins of, of uh, our legal system. Uh, this is, is fascinating. It, uh, really, the, when the country was first beginning, there was sort of this dueling notion of what type of legal system we should have, whether it's common law or whether it's civil law. Uh, what happened at the, at the very early stages of this country? A lot of people in Wisconsin forget that for about 200 years of our history, we were a part of French North America. Um, the French controlled the entire Mississippi Valley from Wisconsin at the north down to New Orleans at the far southern end. France has a civil law system like most continental European countries, uh, whereas Great Britain has a common law system which uh, has come to be the predominant system in the United States. Uh, the differences are very complex in, in simple terms. 
Uh, civil law is kind of a communitarian law. It looks very closely at what results are best for society uh, in addition to the individuals who are involved in a dispute. Common law is much different. Common law concentrates on individual rights, property rights, and civil rights, uh, regardless of whether those rights are good for society as a whole or not. So um, Wisconsin was under a civil law system, although we, we had very few, uh, very few uh, white settlers in Wisconsin for most of that period. But uh, there, there were some civil law influences that persisted in Wisconsin even after statehood, particularly as far as property rights went. You write about the Northwest Ordinance, uh, 1789. It guaranteed certain freedoms. What, what freedoms did that guarantee at the time, and why was that so important to the, the formulation of a, a new legal system? Three, um, three freedoms above all others, Mike. First, an economic freedom. The Northwest Ordinance had what was called a navigation clause. It, uh, traditionally, under English law, rivers and lakes had been considered purely private property unless they were very close to the coastline. The Northwest Ordinance said rivers in Wisconsin belong to the people for recreational and commercial purposes. That was a very early unique feature of American democracy that got embodied in the Northwest Ordinance, which was the organic law for the Midwest. Second feature of the Northwest Ordinance, of course, was the abolition of slavery. The Northwest Ordinance said there will be no <coughs> slavery in the territory north and west of the Ohio River, which included Wisconsin. This was the first time the federal government made any effort to abolish slavery. This is almost 100 years before the Civil War. And the third, and to my mind, most uh, important aspect of the Northwest Ordinance as far as Wisconsin legal history is concerned is that it provided the basic governmental framework for Wisconsin. Uh, it provided for essentially two phases of government. One. Uh, where the territory was first getting started, there were very few people. Washington, Congress, and the president would appoint governors and judges. The second phase came, however, after the territory got up to a population of 5,000. Settlers were allowed to elect their own legislature for the first time. This, in essence, was a colonial system. The territories, including Wisconsin, were essentially colonies of the eastern seaboard states, but it was unique in that it was the first colonial system in world history to provide that colonies would ultimately become co-equals of the colonizers. How challenging was it in the early days, when we're talking about the territories, how challenging was it to establish uh, legitimacy for a legal system in those territories, which were still, in many respects, um, I don't know how to describe it, but, but it was certainly in the very early stages of, of government. Um, how were they able to build uh, legitimacy? It was not an easy task. Um, Wisconsin and other territories were, uh, their legal system consisted entirely of territorial judges uh, appointed by Washington. Our first territorial judge was a man named James Doty. I think many people in the room may have heard of Doty. He's best known as the founder of Madison, but he is also the creator of uh, the Wisconsin's judicial system. Doty faced all sorts of challenges. One of the most basic challenges was simply establishing a fundamental respect for the rule of law in a frontier settlement where many of the people who had come uh, came to Wisconsin because they wanted to get away from legal systems. There's one story, for example, Doty in 1824, right after he becomes a judge, right as he's setting up a court system in Wisconsin, holds court in a little log cabin in Prairie du Chien. And a local prominent citizen, an old French trader named Joseph Rolette, is brought before Doty. Rolette is drunk, he's accused of drunkenness. <laughs> he kind of comes in and he's a big man, 6'3 or 6'4. Doty is a relatively small guy. He comes up, kind of towers over Doty and says, uh, you got no authority over me. I'm the big buck in this place. You know, I'm walking out of here. So Roulette kind of turns his back on Doty, walks out of the building. Doty knows he's at a critical moment. I have to establish respect at a basic physical level here or I'm going to lose any chance of establishing respect for the rule of law in Wisconsin. So Doty runs out of the courthouse, turns around, faces Roulette and stares him down, and eventually Roulette is the one who blinks. He goes back into the courtroom. He's fined for drunkenness, and the incident is over. 
<laughs> and the Wisconsin legal system was born. Well, <laughs> yes. He's not the only one, I should add. There's a story about Andrew Jackson, who not many people know this. Jackson, before he became president and a famous general, started his career as a circuit judge in Frontier, Tennessee. And he had a very similar incident where um, basically he had to face down a guy who had defied his authority in the courtroom, and Jackson threatened to shoot him. The guy he faced down was later asked why he backed down, and he said essentially, well, I've seen a lot of men in my lives, I've had a lot of fights. When I look in a man's eye, sometimes I see shoot, sometimes I see don't shoot. And with Andrew Jack Judge Jackson, I saw shoot, so I backed down. So I think Doty, in his case, also people saw shoot in his eyes. It, it was an interesting time. You write in the book about uh, attorneys and uh, that they had to be, uh, this will sound just impossible to believe, that they had to be entertainers at time. I mean, we've never seen an attorney be an entertainer, but, <laughs> but, but that they did. They almost had to be entertainers. That was part of the process. Well, that's exactly right. Um, being a lawyer in a frontier society was much different than it was today. There, there were a lot of challenges. One, one challenge was uh, being in the wilderness. It was very difficult uh, both for lawyers and litigants to get around. I, I think the lawyers in the room know today if, Many of us practice in Madison, Milwaukee, all over the state, in some cases all over the country. With airplanes, uh, it's easy, and, and interstate highways, it's easy to get around. But back in the early 1800s, mid-1800s, Wisconsin had virtually no transportation system other than dirt trails. Uh, as a result, people lived in very isolated communities, and the only way that the legal system could work was by having a circuit riding system. There would be a judge for, would be appointed for each region of the state, would have to go around from county seat to county seat holding court, and lawyers who practiced in that area would go around with him. I think everybody knows the story about Abe Lincoln and his writing, uh, his circuit in central Illinois. And the way it worked was um, people in the county seats and in the counties surrounding the county seats relied on the law for entertainment. Back then you didn't have the internet, didn't have Facebook, didn't have TV, didn't even have radio. What you had was lawyers coming to town about once every two months or so, and lawyers uh, were expected to provide entertainment at the trials that took place in the courthouse because uh, that was the entertainment they had. And lawyers, if they wanted to stay in practice, had to oblige. They had to be not only skilled lawyers, and they had to be skilled rhetoricians. They had to basically make the eagle scream, as the saying was, lots of flowery purple prose in closing arguments. But eventually, uh, the, for example, the Wisconsin Supreme Court did eventually gain that legitimacy that it sought. The Wisconsin Supreme Court had its crisis of legitimacy in the mid-1850s. Um, the court we think today of political controversy sounding, uh, surrounding the court. Unfortunately, that's not a new thing. Back in the 1850s, when the uh, Supreme Court was just getting started, judges were elected on a partisan basis. It was a highly partisan era, and people who were not in your party generally didn't respect you very much. Um, there was also a big scandal with a judge named Levi Hubble in the early 1850s. Hubble committed or was accused of committing some fairly serious ethical violations, he was impeached by the legislature, the only judge who has ever been impeached. Uh, he, he was not convicted, but his reputation was badly damaged, and coming out of that trial, people were really asking themselves, are, are these guys all political hacks? Should we have any respect for the Wisconsin Supreme Court? The way the court was able to establish its legitimacy came a couple of years later in a contested election um, for the governorship in 1855 between uh, William Barstow, who was the incumbent, and the Republican challenger named Cole Bashford. The election was very close. Bashford uh, came out on the short end, but he challenged the results of the election, saying that Barstow's appointed canvassing board had improperly counted re fraudulent returns from a couple of other counties. Uh, Bashford took his case directly to the Supreme Court, and Barstow, the incumbent, decided that the best way to meet the challenge was to argue that the Supreme Court had no authority over him. Uh, Barstow argued, um, I am the embodiment of the executive branch, you are a separate branch, we are equal branches of government, uh, and therefore I don't have to do what you say. 
The Supreme Court very skillfully worked around him uh, by, by doing two things. Number one, it said, look, we are not trying to set policy here. Um, we are simply a vehicle for expressing the will of the voters stated through the state constitution. But the other thing they did after disclaiming uh, that they had power or that they were political was they said the constitution mandates that we look behind the returns to see if they were fraudulent. They found that the returns were fraudulent. They, they decided that Bashford, the challenger, was in fact the duly elected governor. And that was an end to the institutional crisis for the Supreme Court. Their decision commanded widespread respect. And after that, the court's role as having the final say as to what the law is in Wisconsin was never challenged. You mentioned Andrew Jackson earlier. And, and in your book, you write about uh, an era of uh, Jacksonian jurisprudence. What do you mean by that? What, was, what were the lessons of the, the Jackson era? Jackson had many hats during the course of his life. After starting out as a circuit judge, of course, I think we all know about the Battle of New Orleans. He was a famous general, ultimately became the first truly popularly <coughs> elected president. What was interesting to me, Mike, though, is, and it's something that legal historians have not studied very much, is um, there was a real, I would argue, there was a real Jacksonian jurisprudential movement as well. Prior to the time Jackson became president in the late 1820s, the Federalist Party, the party of Washington and Hamilton, had appointed most of the judges in the country. Uh, Federalist judges um, were honorable, very able people, but they didn't really believe in popular government. They believed in government by gentlemen. They, they believed there was a small class of people who, by virtue of their innate talent or their, their high social background, were the only ones fitted to rule. Jacksonian, the Jacksonian movement, and Jackson himself, of course, exploded all that. And they started a legal movement that exploded uh, traditional ideas of government by elites in many ways as well. Just uh, We could easily spend the rest of the time today talking about that, but just a couple of highlights. <laughs> Um, in the 1820s, states um, went from a system of limited suffrage to universal white male suffrage. They eliminated such requirements as that you have to pay taxes to vote or that you have to own a certain minimum amount of property to vote. Uh, Wisconsin's constitution uh, has always provided, has never had any uh, property owning requirements to vote. Um, a second thing is popular election of judges. Um, Jacksonian states, uh, interestingly Mississippi, was the first state in the country to adopt a system of all elective judges. Prior to the 1830s, every state in the country had strictly appointed judges, appointed either by the governor or the legislature. Wisconsin, as a very enthusiastic Jacksonian state, was one of the first to provide in its constitution in 1848 that all judges in this state are elected. Now, that's been controversial, particularly in recent years, given the uh, political troubles surrounding our Supreme Court. But uh, it uh, has always been the case that all our judges have been elected by the people. And in my opinion, <coughs> that's probably going to continue for the indefinite future. I want to spend a, a couple of moments on, on two big um, issues of the 1800s. Uh, that you write about in the book and, and try to get um, an idea of how Wisconsin uh, helped shape American law with its stance on these issues. So the first one is slavery, and you mentioned that earlier. And, and you write in the book that Wisconsin, really from the get-go, was uh, a place of strong anti-slavery sentiment. That's been a part of who we are since our very early days. It has. Wisconsin has been settled by successive waves of immigrant. We're a very diverse state uh, of, of immigrant backgrounds today, but the first wave of settlers in Wisconsin came from New York and New England, both solidly anti-slavery areas. Um, in the book, Mike, what I try to do is not just describe Wisconsin's legal struggle against slavery, but to put it in the context of the national legal struggle against slavery generally. People often think of slavery as purely a southern phenomenon. Actually, <coughs> northern states had to wrestle with legal issues posed by slavery as well. One of those issues was the enforcement of fugitive slave laws. Um, uh, 
in, as part of the, co the compromise that resulted in the United States Constitution in the late 1700s, the founders inserted a fugitives uh, clause, essentially requiring northern states to try to capture slaves who escaped from the south, seeking freedom in the north, and to return those slaves to their owners. Um, in, starting in the 1820s, many northern states, as the abolition movement grew, became very resistant to the federal fugitive clause. Several states, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, passed what were called personal liberty laws, basically forbidding local law enforcement officials to assist slave catchers in any way. In Wisconsin, this controversy came to a head in what were called the Booth cases, named after Sherman Booth, a, a local abolitionist who assisted in the freeing a jailbreak for a fugitive slave named Joshua Glover, who was uh, captured by Milwaukee law officials after he escaped from Missouri. There's actually an interesting plaque down on the old courthouse yeah, square mm -hmm. that commemorates that. Mm -hmm. Um, long story short, though, um, prior to the Booth uh, incident, the U.S. Supreme Court had looked at northern personal liberty laws and had said basically, look, there is a new federal fugitive slave law, in effect, that requires northern law enforcement officials to assist uh, slave catchers in capturing slaves. This law was challenged by the legal wing of the uh, anti-slavery movement in several states, but the northern states in which it was challenged, the judges made it clear they did not sympathize with slavery, but they felt that because the U.S. Supreme Court had said this fugitive law was, unconsti was constitutional, uh, they had to enforce it and they had to require state officials to help recapture fugitive slaves. In 1854, uh, Booth's lawyers mounted a challenge in Wisconsin to the law, and our Supreme Court became the first and ultimately the only Supreme Court to denounce the U.S. Supreme Court and say that the federal fugitive law was unconstitutional. And that resulted in a five-year-long battle between our Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court. Interesting. Um, Railroads. Uh, about 1860, we started seeing this massive construction of railroads in the United States, and and we've all heard the stories of the the railroad tycoons and the railroad barons, and uh, the railroads made great demands. And Wisconsin, again showing a, a leadership, um, along with several Midwestern states, decided to fight back against the railroads. What exactly did they do, and why did that make them? Um, perhaps a, a, a national uh, story, in a sense. We go here from slavery and the Civil War to the economic and uh, civil liberties aftermath of the Civil War. Um, you're right, Mike. After the Civil War, railroads started expanding and growing dramatically, particularly in the Midwest. They started becoming increasingly powerful. And this um, sparked Jacksonian concerns in a number of Midwestern judges who had cut their political teeth during the Jacksonian era. They were concerned that where Andrew Jackson had been worried about banks as a threat to American democracy due to their concentration of economic power, banks had been tamed. Now it was railroads that were the big problem. So Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, Iowa passed what were called Granger Laws. These are important because they were the first major state regulatory laws in American history. They all, uh, they, they varied in the scope of their regulation, but they all essentially said railroads are subject to regulation as far as their rates goes. They may not uh, uh, enact discriminatory rates uh, and so forth. There was a, a serious legal challenge. Railroads obviously were not happy about being regulated. They brought a constitutional challenge based largely on the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. They said we have a liberty and a property right to run our business in the way they want to. Any attempt to regulate that is unconstitutional. At the same time, they said, although you can't regulate us, we want you to subsidize us as well. Many, many state governments, many uh, municipalities were, were willing to pay whatever it took to get a railroad to pass through their territory. A lot of them ended up paying a very steep price for that because in Wisconsin there was a big depression in the late 1850s which uh, caused every railroad in the state to go bankrupt and left a lot of municipalities that had subsidized the railroads kind of holding the bag financially. So 
In the 1870s, the Granger Laws were challenged, the right of states and municipalities to subsidize railroads were challenged, and ultimately, um, the Midwest uh, Supreme Courts led a revolt. An Iowa judge named John Dillon, a Michigan Supreme Court justice named Thomas Cooley, many of you may have heard of them if you studied constitutional law, said two things. They said, number one, um, states have only a limited right to regulate railroads. Wisconsin contributed importantly to that by saying, well, um, states and municipalities may subsidize railroads, but only if the subsidies are tied into the right to regulate the railroads. That was a unique principle that our Chief Justice Luther Dixon established. So between that and a number of Midwestern cases, uh, including a decision by Chief Justice Edward Ryan, said regulatory laws are constitutional. From now on, it is indisputable that states have the right to regulate business. A big deal. Very important. Uh, but much overlooked uh, episode in American legal history. Let's, let's jump to uh, 1900 um, and, and talk about the progressive movement um, because Wisconsin likes to think itself think of itself as sort of the, the, the place where uh, progressive politics began. And, uh, but we all know that sometimes over the course of, of uh, a lot of years, um, what we think we were is not always the case. Maybe we weren't exactly that. But in the case of progressivism in Wisconsin, were we uh, a national leader? We were. It's, it's an interesting question. One of the things I wanted to accomplish in the book was to examine that. I mean, I think everybody in here who's ever had a high school or a college course in Wisconsin history has heard about the progressive age as the golden era of Wisconsin. We have the image of fighting Bob LaFollette coming in to fight the party bosses and institute good government. and and uh, institute improved workplace safety for the people and many other reforms as well. So I, as you suggest, Mike, I, I approach that with a little bit of a skeptical eye. Uh, I asked myself two things. Well, you know, the progressive movement was really a national movement. Were we a leader or were, were we just in the middle of the pack? And the second thing was, were we really that progressive? Um, and I came to a number of interesting conclusions, which are kind of outlined in one of the book's chapters. Uh, I, th I think the bottom line here is I concluded, you know, this is one area where Wisconsin's hyping of itself is really well-deserved hype. I, I looked at what many other states had done in the progressive era, and we truly were, I think, the national leader in many respects. Um, just, just a couple of quick mm -hmm. comments. Um, it's one fallacy I found, though, is progressivism did not originate with fighting Bob LaFollette when he became governor in 1900. Progressivism started in some areas as much as 20, 30 years before the progressive era. We, th we think of the late 19th century as an era dominated by bosses, an era of political corruption and reaction. There was some of that, but there were also some genuine beginnings of reform, too, to try to bring law into sync with the rise of the industrial era. Um, but looking at, at things as a whole, Wisconsin, between 1900 and 1915, when the progressives were tossed out of power, accomplished an incredible variety of reforms. We had the nation's first direct primary system. We had the nation's first legally upheld workable workers' compensation system. And in 1911, we passed something called the industrial uh, the Industrial Commission law, which created the nation's first state agency tasked solely with regulating workplace safety. Just an incredible variety of reforms, many of which served as national models. Well, what role, uh, for example, did the Wisconsin Supreme Court play in, in upholding these progressive reforms? That was one of the uh, very interesting hidden stories that I covered, one of the most interesting in the book, I would say. Uh, people, when they think of the Progressive Era, think of fighting Bob LaFollette. Uh, they sometimes think of John Commons, a professor at the University of Wisconsin who was the uh, originator of many of the reform ideas that LaFollette later got enacted into law. But they don't think very often of, of what role the courts had in it. And it turns out it's, it's really a very interesting story. Uh, those in the room who have taken constitutional law courses in law school may remember a concept called substantive due process. The, the popular image is that when progressive reforms started throughout the country, many conservative judges used the due process doctrine that I talked about earlier to strike down uh, 
reform laws. So I took a look and said, well, was that really true in Wisconsin? And the answer is sort of yes and sort of no. Up until about 1910, Wisconsin Supreme Court was very skeptical of many of the progressive reforms. Um, there was a very prominent judge named Rouget Marshall who was uh, what is called a constitutional originalist. He believed in limited government, uh, believed that government really should not try to regulate business any more than absolutely necessary. He uh, was instrumental in getting several early progressive reform measures struck down. But in uh, around 1909, um, John Winslow, who had just become the Chief Justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, took Marshall on as an intellectual adversary. Marshall, um, we, think, we think of polarized times now. There was real polarization back then between progressives and conservatives. Progressives, led by no less than Theodore Roosevelt, were so angry at conservative judges that Roosevelt, when he campaigned for president in 1912, proposed a series of measures to restrict conservative judges. For example, mandatory requirement age or, age or court packing procedures. Winslow wanted to head this, path, this off at the pass. So starting about 1909, he did two things. Number one, he went out, basically gave speeches, wrote law review articles for anybody who would read or listen, basically saying to the conservatives, look, you have to be flexible here. There are, the industrial age is, is creating new social needs that the founders never envisioned. If we don't uh, accommodate those, you're setting up the stage for revolution in the country for the Theodore Roosevelt's of the world to prevail in their measures to overturn uh, judgeships. Um, the other thing he said to the progressives, though, was, look, you've got to stop attacking the courts so directly. You may not like our decisions, but I am telling you we don't have a political agenda. We honestly try to analyze the law the best we can, and we try to be objective. Uh, Winslow ultimately succeeded. After about 1910, the Wisconsin Supreme Court stops um, striking down reform laws on a regular basis. A series of important laws are upheld in 1911, 1912, and by the end of the progressive era, the court is much more deferential to reform than it was before. And I should also add, Mike, I looked at whether this was the case in other states. Uh, there's a lot of variation. Some states were conservative all the way through the progressive era. Some state courts were liberal all the way through the progressive era, but there were a lot of courts, like Wisconsin, who were initially conservative, but about 1909, 1910, they start turning the other way, probably because of the progressive complaints and the fact that they're getting really worried about them. You, you also write about uh, uh, Fighting Bob's uh, son, Phil LaFollette, who was governor on a couple of different occasions in Wisconsin, and the impact of, of uh, New Deal uh, legislation. And uh, we could talk about that, but I want to skip ahead a little bit because I have some ground that I still want to cover with you before the hour gets ahead of me here. Um, I want to talk to you about the, the fight for equality in, in Wisconsin and around the country. Um, <clears throat> spend a couple of moments on what happened in Milwaukee in 1965, where you have Lloyd Barbie, prominent Milwaukee attorney, African-American attorney, files a lawsuit saying that Milwaukee public schools are segregated and that needs to change. Um, and in terms of a timeline, was Wisconsin late to the game in those sorts of lawsuits? Were we um, ahead of the, the curve on that? Where, where were we, historically speaking? I think the best way to put it is this. I, th I think too many of us in the North think that the civil rights movement of the mid-20th century was, was a Southern phenomenon. We think of Dr. King, we think of Selma, we think of Birmingham, we think of what happened in the South. We forget, though, there was <laughs> a very hard struggle for racial equality in the North as well. It was different in many ways, but it was also similar in many ways. It's still going on to this day. Um, were we, you ask, were we late to the game or early to the game? The, civil, the modern civil rights movement, of course, got underway in the South uh, immediately after Brown versus Board of Education. The South went through about a 10-year period of what was called massive resistance, open legal defiance of the Brown decision in many deep south states. Uh, Northerners were kind of out of the line of fire of civil rights lawsuits, school desegregation lawsuits. That all started to change, though, about 10 years after Brown. And I, I would say, Mike, we were, Wisconsin was kind of in the vanguard of the northern part of the civil rights movement. Um, 
In the early 1960s, Lloyd Barbie, recently deceased, but a state legislator from Milwaukee, a very prominent figure in the Milwaukee community and in Wisconsin history generally, uh, became the head of the local chapter of the NAACP. He had come to Madison to go to UW Law School and had gotten his first taste of racial discrimination northern style in Madison, unfortunately. He saw that in Milwaukee you had resi very, uh, very stark residential segregation at that time. Almost all black Milwaukeeans lived in the inner core of Milwaukee. And because Milwaukee had a residential school policy, that meant that you had virtually all of Milwaukee's black children going to all black schools. So there was kind of hyper segregation in the schools. Um, Lloyd Barbie, trying to carry out the mandate of Brown and trying to carry out Dr. King's vision, went to the Milwaukee Public School Board in the early 60s and tried to negotiate uh, a modification of the neighborhood school system to try to provide some integration. Uh, the school board at that time was very set in its ways, basically said, hey, neighborhood schools are good. We've always done it this way. We didn't create, uh, we didn't create segregation. That's a residential housing problem. That's not our problem. Um, Barbie, after negotiations failed, tried some marches, tried, tried demonstrations. That didn't work either. Um, unfortunately, some Milwaukeeans, particularly Father Grappi, were sympathetic and helped out. Many Milwaukeeans, uh, we being a very orderly community, don't really like to see uh, the order, established order disturbed, so the, the marches were not very successful. So. In 1965, Barbie files Milwaukee's desegregation lawsuit, which is one of the first major school desegregation lawsuits in the North, but far from the last. Uh, you write in this book, uh, and I want to spend the remaining time that we have, you write in this book about a changing notion of, of liberty and, and the impact that is having on our legal system today. What do you mean by, how has liberty, the notion of liberty changed? The last chapter of the book, Mike, uh, tries to make sense of uh, the trends in American law over the last 50 years. I remember, I remember Gordon Hilton, uh, who used to teach here, when, when I first started talking with him about legal history, basically challenged me saying, well, it's easy to, to make grand historical pronouncements about things that happened a long time ago, but the real challenge is can you make historical pronouncements about what's going on in the modern era. So I took Gordon up on his challenge in the final chapter of the book here. And Gordon, wherever you are today, <laughs> thank you for that challenge. So um, Mike, to answer your question, the central theme that I have found that I believe uh, dr has driven American law since 1960 is involves the concept of equality, but I would phrase that in terms of what is called expressive individualism. Prior to the 1960s, we were largely a communitarian society. We believed in civil rights and freedom, freedom of expression, but there were very, very sharp social norms. People allowed political debate, a variation of lifestyles, but only within fairly narrow bounds. If you tried to expand yourself outside those bounds, for example, if you wanted to lead a gay lifestyle back then, that was outside the invisible but very real barriers that, that was really not tolerated by most people. What has changed over the last 50 years is we have seen the rise of expressive individualism, what was called in the 1960s the do your own thing philosophy. I think one way this has triumphed is today, whichever side of the political spectrum you're on, it is, it is accepted by the vast majority of Americans that unless you're actively harming somebody else, you should have the right to express your beliefs, your lifestyle in any way you want to. There are no more limits. So how has that shaped American law? Well, we, we could talk on and on about that, but I would put it to you, the central, the central themes of American law since the 1960s have been a battle between supporters of expressive individualism, the un unrestricted right of freedom to express yourself versus traditionalists, people who view expressive individualism as a threat to traditional and, and valuable American beliefs and are fighting against that. That has played out in a number of ways. For example, the gay rights movement, the school voucher system, and uh, one thing we talk about in the book is the fight over abortion rights. Well, let's, there are others as well. Let's talk about the, the voucher movement for a moment because uh, that did put Wisconsin at the forefront of, of legal decisions in many respects. That's the, 
the cradle of, of the, the school choice movement, and, and I think we could accurately say. Um, how does that fit into this? When you talk about the expressive individualism, how does the voucher uh, uh, discussion fit into that, that larger picture? Well, it shows that you can't really characterize individual expressionism as conservative or liberal. What, what my experience was, I mean, I mean, we think of do your own thing as something we associate with flower children from the 1960s with sort of, sort of a liberal vibe, but in fact, I would put it to you, school vouchers in, in our, uh, the school voucher movement politically has broken down where most people who support vouchers are characterized as conservatives, opponents are characterized as liberal. That was certainly how the division broke down when the, constitution of the constitutionality of the voucher law came before the Wisconsin Supreme Court in the 1990s. But I would put it to you, the voucher movement to me is an example of expressive individualism. Prior to the voucher movement, the prevailing ethic of education in Wisconsin and America was that schools should be used as a melting pot. They should be the ultimate expression of communal values. This is where children of all social and ethnic backgrounds go to learn common American values. Or There's obviously a political debate over what common American values should be. But the voucher movement has gone the other way. As the Wisconsin Supreme Court said when it upheld the voucher program, um, we have to look at the, we have to place value on the rights of parents to express themselves in deciding what sort of education their children should have. We should pay less deference in the future to what school officials think those values should be. And vouchers, in the eyes of the legislature, and a narrow majority of the Wisconsin Supreme Court were a valuable vehicle for promoting parents' right to expressive individualism. Uh, you write in the book about the American age of fracture, and, and I think you're talking about our, our politics, our nation's politics. What does that uh, bode for the future? And, and let's look at that from a Wisconsin perspective, what it might mean for the Wisconsin legal system. Um, but, but give us some observations on, on what you think this means for us as we move forward, that we have this, instead of consensus, you refer to it as dissensus. That's what's happening in our country. Right, and that has been expressed most dramatically on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. One thing I did was, um, I, I think all the lawyers in this room, anybody who studies the Wisconsin Supreme Court's decisions know that over the, in recent times, when you go to read a Wisconsin Supreme Court decision, it's not always a unanimous decision. It's usually there will be three or four different groups of judges, each one of which writes lengthy, sometimes overly lengthy, opinions giving their particular take on the subject. So I wanted to see, has this always been the case? And I found um, dramatically it has not. I, w I went back and added up, okay, back starting in 1940, how often did, when the Wisconsin Supreme Court decided cases, how often were its opinions unanimous? How often were there dissents? How often were there multiple dissents? In 1940, I think about 92% of all decisions were unanimous. That has steadily gone downhill since then to the point where in 2010, the last year that I looked at, it's now something like 17% of Wisconsin Supreme Court decisions are unanimous, only one out of six. More than half, you have two or more judges dissenting. In addition to that, you can't quantitatively analyze this, but if you look at the decisions in recent years, there has been, unfortunately, a rise in the vitriolic tone of many of the decisions. Um, I talked about the school voucher case. I looked at that as kind of the opening of the age of vitriol on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The decisions the dissenting opinions and the majority opinions over school vouchers are, there's a lot of political talk as well as legal talk and strikingly bitter language used in both the majority and the dissenting opinions. Um, that's an extreme example, but if you look at modern day opinions, um, there's, there's more vitriol than there used to be. And I think that's a function that judges feel free to express themselves individually by kind of letting themselves go rhetorically. So my final question is, is it possible to find a, a new framework uh, for social and, and legal consensus? Is that possible? I hope so. Um, I think we all know about the time of troubles in 2010, 2011, the, the incidents where there were some physical altercations on the court that got reported in the press. 
My view is, I, I think after that, the court, that was kind of a wake-up call for the court. I, I have seen on the court an effort to be more, there's still a lot of dissent, but I think people are genuinely trying to be more, more civil than they used to be. And then another, really quickly, Mike, another interesting thing is, as part of the age of expressive individualism, uh, the judiciary initiated a movement called the New Federalism. Uh, Supreme Court Justice William Brennan, after the end of the Warren Court era, urged state judges to uh, act as a check on any effort by the U.S. Supreme Court to restrict civil liberties by interpreting state constitutions to provide expanded civil liberties. What's interesting to me is that in the 70s and 80s, the Wisconsin Supreme Court tried to do that a number of times, but over the years, uh, they have more and more edged away from that and have tried to follow U.S. Supreme Court guidelines as to civil liberties. So my hope is, between the edging away from new federalism and the efforts that the justices are, ma are making to make nice, nicer with each other than they used to, I am cautiously optimistic that uh, the age of communal values in the legal community is not dead. Good to end on an optimistic note. We'll take questions from the audience. Um, if you are in the, the lower seating bowl, please press down on the, uh, this, what's the best way to do this? This is all new for me, isn't it, Steve? Where it says push. Where it says push, <laughs> push down on that. <laughs> they get tougher as we go on. <laughs> this is how you express your individuals. <laughs> if you have a question, raise your hand push and uh, we'll call on you. If you're in the back and you have a question, please raise your hand. And Steve, who has the microphone, will do it the old-fashioned way. Steve will come over, hold the microphone in front of you. We ask that the questions be brief so that we can get to as many as possible. We'll start down here. Let me get out of your way so you can see the person. How much did the new immigrants in the 1800s and early 1900s affect the law? Yep. There are a couple of chapters that are, that are devoted right. to this subject. Um, the answer is a lot. We're just one quick example. Did everybody hear the question? No. Okay. Oh, sorry. Well, it, it was how did the new immigrants in the 1800s, for example, um, how did they affect the, the legal system in Wisconsin? Two main examples. One, there was a big fight over prohibition in Wisconsin in the 1850s. Um, in the 1850s, that was the time when we had the first big wave of German immigration into the United States. Germans, part of the culture is drinking beer on, on Sunday and other times of recreation. The culture of the Yankees was they felt demon alcohol had to be regulated. The state went back and forth. There was actually a referendum on whether we should adopt prohibition in the mid-1850s. Uh, it was, believe it or not, narrowly passed, but it was vetoed by Governor Barstow, the guy we talked about earlier, who basically said, uh, number one, we have to respect the Germans. Why shouldn't they have the right to drink beer? And more, more importantly, breweries are a part of their economy, and if you think I'm going to shut them down with prohibition, ain't going to happen. The other, the other major um, contribution immigrants made was we talked about the voucher program. That's not the first time that schools have been a legal battleground in Wisconsin. Throughout the last half of the 19th century, there was a battle over whether uh, particularly Catholic immigrants should be allowed to establish parochial schools and teach their children in the German language. Uh, we passed a law in 1889 called the Bennett Law prohibiting parochial schools from teaching students in the German language. Uh, that caused a political revolution in Wisconsin. The next legislature uh, became Democratic rather than Republican and overturned the law. The battle was not over, though. There was kind of a running battle over how quickly immigrants should be uh, pressured into assimilating into American values, including speaking English. Mm -hmm. Great question. Complicated, interesting area. Um, let me take right there, you, yeah. Uh, I am not a lawyer, uh, but it's my impression, and please correct me if I'm wrong, and I hope I am wrong, that uh, the Wisconsin Supreme Court no longer has to, re members of the Wisconsin Supreme Court no li longer have to recuse themselves if there's a, a conflict of interest. Do you want to repeat the question? Do everybody hear the question? Yes, no? Okay. Uh, I can repeat it. Uh, she said it's her impression, she's not a lawyer, that's the first part. Uh, her impression is that uh, justices on the Supreme Court do not have to recuse themselves. 
if there is a conflict of interest? That was the question. Okay. Is that the case? From a historical perspective, that's, that's sort of tangentially related to the culture of dissensus that I, I talked about. But the answer to your question, ma'am, is no. That's not quite correct, but you are right that there, that is a very controversial issue right now. Uh, Supreme Court justices are required to accuse themselves in the case of a conflict of interest, but the, the question is, what is a conflict of interest? For example, uh, some reformers have recently proposed a rule saying if, if somebody, if a litigant comes before you and they made a campaign contribution to your campaign, in excess of $5,000, $10,000, you should automatically recuse yourselves. And so far, a majority of the Wisconsin Supreme Court is saying, no, we're not going to enact that rule. We can decide cases perfectly fairly, no matter who contributes to our campaign. Um, there, had, there was, about 10 years ago, a US Supreme Court decision uh, that said there are limits on that. That involved a West Virginia judge who provided the key vote uh, in favor of a coal mining company that had essentially single-handedly funded his entire election campaign. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, 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 that's going too far. You do have to recuse. But that's an extreme situation. There is a big gray area in the middle, and where the line should be drawn in Wisconsin is, is very much a subject of debate right now. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, wait for the microphone, if you would, just a second. <laughs> I was a high school history teacher for a long time, and I, for years I used a, a book that I, my kids liked uh, by a, a law professor by the name of Hearst. Uh, and I thought that was a very important book as regard to law, both in Wisconsin. But you didn't mention it, so I'm wondering, was it as important as I thought it was? <laughs> Willard Hurst uh, taught at UW Law School for many, many years. He was considered probably the leading American legal historian of, of his generation. He, he wrote a number of books. I'm, I'm curious which one you taught. He, he did one on the history of the Wisconsin lumber industry and a couple of more theoretical books. Law and the Conditions of Freedom. Law and the Conditions of Freedom. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to remember which one that was. I think. Let me let me say this. He he wrote a very detailed book, an examination of the Wisconsin lumber industry. That's like 800 pages of fine print. I doubt that's the one you used. But as I recall, Law and the Conditions of Freedom is one in which he developed what an idea that we didn't have time to discuss today called legal instrumentalism. He talked about the fact that in the early 1800s, judges explicitly used the law to try to encourage um, industrialists, business entrepreneurs, um, but rather than to protect traditional landowners' property rights. Classic example, um, if, if a mill owner in the early 1800s wants to build a dam so they can operate a water mill, well, that's going to flood upstream land under traditional common law the upstream landowner had the right to shut the mill down because, hey, you can't interfere with my property no matter what. Judges created special laws, special mill dam laws and case decisions in the early 1800s, allowing mill dam owners to flood uh, upstream lands, even though that interfered with property rights, as long as they paid a regular price for their flooding. The courts essentially said, hey, yeah, we know it's not traditional common law, but uh, we have to have this in order to grow the economy. So Hearst was the first one to kind of have that insight, and he, he really uh, made a very important connection between uh, the law and economic development and kind of the way in which sometimes judges have tried to promote economic development, and sometimes, like we talked about with the railroads, they say, hey, enough, now we got to regulate you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, yes, we can go right over there. Hang on a second. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in 1873, a Wisconsin Chief Justice, Edward Ryan, uh, warned that there was looming on the horizon a, a dark power, which he then characterized as unfettered capitalism, and warned that um, we were in trouble if our elected officials became corporate um, 
feudal serfs of corporate capital. This was discussed in an editorial by the Cap, Cap Times back in 2016. Um, are there instances where the Wisconsin Supreme Court in recent history has come down on one side or the other of, in terms of challenging um, the idea that our politics should be run by feudal serfs of corporate capital? Well, that question demands a very broad answer and probably a book of its own. <laughs> um, let me make a couple of comments. First, to answer your question directly, well, let me back up and talk a little bit about Ryan. Ryan the theme of law and law versus corporate power and how far to go in checking corporate power has been a theme uh, of American legal history and Wisconsin history ever since the Jacksonian era. You, you mentioned Ryan's uh, commencement address to, the law, to UW Law School, which I talk about a little bit in the book. He's, he is doing that in 1873, right, at, right uh, when railroads are starting to loom as, as, as a bit of a perceived threat. And Ryan is speaking like a good Jacksonian. The Jacksonians thought that banks were corporate monsters back in the 1830s. Ryan saw them as evil because they concentrate money and power, tried to regulate them. In the 1870s, the banks are no longer a big threat. Railroads are now the threat. So Ryan is channeling his inner Jacksonian, and he's now saying the new threat is railroads, and we've got to regulate them. So a couple of years after his speech, he becomes Chief Justice, and his very first decision is a critically important decision upholding the state's Granger Law, the right to regulate railroads. Also, another connection, in the audience for that law school commencement speech was a young law school graduate named Bob La Follette. And La Follette, when he became governor and started the progressive movement, went out of his way to cite Ryan and to cite that speech as an inspiration. So quickly, to get to your question, what about nowadays? Um, there's still an ongoing debate, and I think always will be, about the scope to which government should be allowed to regulate uh, corporations, but that is taking place now in very different forms than it did a hundred years ago in Ryan's day. I, I think it's pretty well established now. Um, there, there is a new movement afoot nationally and in the state to question the extent uh, to which the state should be allowed to regulate corporations, but the fact is we have an extensive network of administrative agencies and regulations that in, in to some one extent or another is going to be here to stay. Uh, it may be cut back, but it will never disappear or go back to the levels it was at in the 1870s, I think. Uh, the battle is also playing out in a number of other ways. One, one area, for example, is limitations on tort liability. There has been an ongoing battle since the 1970s. How easy should we make it for injury victims, medical malpractice victims, to sue doctors and insurance companies. Uh, since the 1970s, uh, many doctors, many insurance companies, other companies that want to limit their liability for the goods and services they produce have tried to cut back the law. They have had some success, but the fact is, compared to how it was 100 years ago, even today, as the regulatory state starts to shrink a little bit, uh, consumers have more protections and corporations are subject to infinitely more regulation than they were 100 years ago. Thanks for your question. I think I'm going to wrap things up there. Before we go, uh, just a, a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Uh, please go to our website, law.marquette.edu, to check out the latest schedule. We keep adding events to the spring schedule for On the Issues. Our next two events, uh, next Tuesday and next Thursday, are both sold out. I hope you've already registered for those. On Tuesday, it's part of the Mission Week uh, proceedings here at uh, Marquette University. We'll be talking with a couple of people who've been on a, a really fascinating uh, journey of racial healing. Uh, they'll be here on Tuesday. Uh, they've written a book about their experience. On Thursday, Ed Flynn, the Milwaukee police chief who's wrapping up his tenure here in Milwaukee, will join us for one final time. And I understand there are just a few seats left uh, for February 15th. That's a week from, uh, well, it's February 15th is a Thursday, I believe. Um, that should be a good one. It's Mark Hogan. He's the secretary of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, lead negotiator on the Foxconn deal. He will be here to talk about how that deal came about and some of the questions that uh, 
some of you in the audience may have about it. Um, besides that, one other thing. If you're interested in picking up a copy of J. Ranney's book, Wisconsin and the Shaping of American Law, there are some right out here in the lobby. Uh, I think Jay would be glad to sign those for you. Absolutely. And, uh, and they're there for purchase, so uh, we would be glad to, to make that offer to you. It's a great book. I, I speak firsthand. Uh, really enjoyed it. Read it over the holidays. Terrific book. Um, having said that, as we always do, thank you for your time, for your interest, for your attention, and most of all, thanks to Jay Ranney, Wisconsin, and the Shaping of American Law. Thank you, Mike. Nice job.